My guest today is Jeff Blankenberg. Jeff, how you doing? I'm good, David. How are you? I'm doing great. It's great to have you back on the show. It's been uh, over 11 years. 11 years. Yeah. I mean, there's there's two things to that. One, I can't believe it's been 11 years since you and I have sat down to do an interview like this. Yes. Uh, but two, I can't believe that you've had this program going for that long. I mean, that is a remarkable Yeah, I feat. think it's uh, 12 or 13. And it started here at CodeMash. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't the know that. The very first episode. Well, that's awesome. Our, we're here. I interviewed... Uh, uh, John Keller and Steve Smith. Nice. That first uh, day. Two fantastic friends of mine. Uh, yeah. Both great people. Yeah, agreed. Uh, so, um, so a lot has changed since then. Like this, well, you were you were actually working at Microsoft, and then you left, and then I I took the same job. Yeah. It wasn't that older, but and now you're doing what? So, f just over five years ago, I joined the Amazon Alexa team, and so uh, it was right after the first Echo had been released. Um, and I, I got an opportunity to come in and kind of do a lot of the same kinds of work that I was doing at Microsoft, where I was, you know, really focused on Windows Phone and Windows 8. Um, Alexa has a developer ecosystem too, and so you right. can build all sorts of apps for voice. And it, it looked like the future to me, mm -hmm. and it still does. And so that was something that I was really attracted to. And in fact, a friend of mine, I, I don't know if he's been on your show or not, but there was another uh, Microsoft evangelist, his name is Davis Bitsky. He's, I remember Dave. He has been on my show a long, long time ago, yeah. even before you, I think. Uh, wow. Uh, and so uh, Dave was an old friend of mine from Microsoft, and I reached out to him, and I said, hey, is there anything cool going on at Amazon that might be interesting? And he goes, I was actually going to call you today because <laughs> we have this Alexa stuff. I think you'd be great. Um, you were literally on my list to call today. And I was like, that is an unbelievable circumstance, yeah. but I will take it. And so we talked, and we did the interview and all the stuff, and now it's been just over five years. Well, if you've been there five years, I have to believe it was the right decision that you Yes. Happy that yeah, I, I am very happy. I feel like uh, my team is happy with me, I, th I think. They would have you fired know. you by now yeah, if they, they weren't. For sure. <laughs> for sure they would have. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. It's great. Excellent. Uh, what do you want to talk about today? Well, uh, you know, you and I talked a little bit about this earlier, but the idea of uh, I love to talk about the future. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the time that Alexa came out, it was very future. Yeah, we've been talking about the past for the last two minutes. <laughs> right. But we, we look at the, the future of where things are going and, and the, the technology that we have. So, you know, when we think about Alexa and, and voice devices, um, we always spun it like the Star Trek computer, right? It was this cool thing that was around you and you could talk to it and you mm -hmm. could get answers and you could get the information you needed. Yeah. And I think that that, um, that example, that analogy works pretty well, but I don't think it really expands broadly enough to what, I, what I think the future is going to look like uh, when we think about these kinds of devices, because it's not just about me talking to a hockey puck that sits on my kitchen counter. Mm -hmm. It's about all of the other stuff that goes along with it, right? Um, the ability to have my house know what it should do, when it should do it. Okay. Far beyond a couple of if statements or uh, you know setting some settings in an app. Yeah, but we really, do a little bit of that now. I, yeah. I tell it when to turn the lights on and turn them off and. I don't have a lot of smart devices, but I, I do sure. have a but, but on you, office. Product. But you tell it to do that, right? Like, hey, I want you to turn the bedroom lights on. It's on, on demand, on. correct. Right. Um, where I think we're headed is that, uh, and the analogy that I like to use today is having a real human assistant. So imagine you and I were important enough to have like a real human assistant that is yeah. there to <laughs> assist and provide all of the, the logistics that we need around. So uh, it, anybody, anybody's seen this in like a, re, a movie or a TV show. Somebody has an assistant and they- yeah, a man they, Friday. Right, they're, they're, <laughs> a, they're a taskmaster, right? They, they take care of a lot of the things that you can't focus on because you have bigger problems. Right. Or, or, I, I'm not that important, I don't know, but <laughs> I can uh, picture having an assistant. And when I think about an assistant, there's a lot of things that go into that that are kind of innate to that relationship. So, you know, you always see the trope of like, um, an assistant shows up for their boss and they have a coffee. Uh, right. Well, they don't just have a coffee. They yeah. have the coffee that that person likes. The exact amount from of the cream store. Yeah, exactly. The they brand. know everything they want about that thing. It's a French roast and dark. Oftentimes, we think about uh, voice assistants. We think, please get me a coffee. And then it goes and gets you the coffee, and the coffee shows up. But realistically, in a real human assistant world, that's not how it works at all. The human assistant takes the initiative to say, this person is going to need coffee. I'm going to go get them a coffee so they have it at 10 o'clock before the big meeting that they have. Right. Right. And so the the main character of that entire story is still the, the manager or whatever, mm -hmm. but they never took any action. And I think that's the path that we're headed towards is that 
you will have an, this kind of ambient computing all around right. you that what's devices and sensors and everything else that is able to take action on your behalf without you having to ask for it. That's interesting. We're seeing a little bit of that in, uh, in online advertising where if I buy a fishing pole, then it, does, it figures out, oh, this person must need some fishing lures, for yeah. example. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, uh, I think that's... Which can be helpful, but sometimes it's annoying. It can also be super annoying. Um, and I think that there's opportunities to help shape and grow that. But as we, th as we think about, like, again, I, I lean into a lot of the sci-fi movie tropes. So when you think about, like, real artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. I don't want to take it so far as, like... Hal or like, wow. the, like the, or the, so the scary here. side of things, right? <laughs> I, I want to keep it on a very positive, uplifting side of how AI can support and help us. But when we start thinking about the, the capacity it has to really solve problems for us, yes. uh, it's amazing. And uh, I'll give an example of that. My, my dad is a dentist. Mm -hmm. And so I, I grew up running around a dental office when I was a kid and whatever. And he, he had uh, a person that was manning the phones and like booking appointments and doing this was way before computers were in every office. And as a part of that, I realized just how much people don't like calling to make a dental appointment. Hmm. They don't want to have to go to the dentist in the first place. Right. They don't want to pay for it because it's expensive. Uh, and on top of that, it's an inconvenience in their schedule because the dentist, if they work reasonable hours, they're not available when people are at work, right? They, they need to keep them open until eight or nine o'clock at night so that people can come after work and still yeah. get their appointments and everything. And so it's a major frustration on a number of levels for the patient because there's so much that goes into it and they have to keep their schedule free and do I have a calendar? And so those phone calls become, uh, I, I like to describe it as like a human API. You're on one end, I'm on the other end. And it's like, do you have next Tuesday free? Well, no, but we do have Wednesday morning. Oh, I don't have Wednesday free. And so you're, you're doing that, these calls back hit, and forth. Hit right? or miss conversations. Yeah. It's frustrating and inefficient. And so one of the examples I like to think of, of like this AI assistant world is that instead of any of that, instead of me ever sweating or thinking about a dental appointment at all, Instead, I just get a notification one day that says, hey, you have a dental appointment next Tuesday. Uh, and then it, because it, it not only knows when you're free, but it also knows it's been four or five months since right. your last dental yeah, appointment, it, how frequently you want it. You've cleared the six-month window. It talked to your healthcare provider to make sure that you were free and clear to mm -hmm. do that. Like, it handled all of the things so that the appointment could be booked. Like, that is amazing. Right. And at its core, all of that is possible today. The challenge is getting the context. And this is, the, this is the thing that's the biggest to me, is context is key in all of this. Because if it doesn't know what your calendar is, mm -hmm. if it doesn't know what your dentist calendar is, if it doesn't know who your healthcare provider is, it can't make these decisions. And we are growing up in a world of technology where everybody wants to build their own walled garden because data is king, right? If right. you have the data, you win. And so everybody is like, oh, well, we want to keep our data over here and we mm -hmm. want to keep this thing. And so we don't expose APIs. We don't share this information. I was just talking with... Uh, someone from a grocery store chain, and they were telling me about how, uh, I was complaining about how, man, I wish you could give me information in a way that would allow me to navigate the store I go to. Mm -hmm. So when I make my shopping list, it presents it in the order that I'm gonna go through the store. Hmm. So that I'm not like, oh, I forgot the whipped cream because it was at the bottom of the list that I added last. Mm -hmm. It's giving me the entire shopping list in the order that I'll travel through the store. And he goes, oh, we have that information. And You're I was like, not telling you it. <laughs> why don't you share that? He goes, well, because we, we like people to get lost in the store. We want them to find products that they wouldn't have otherwise found. That's why they hide the sale items way in the back. Exactly. That's why the milk is always buried. Milk, in the yeah, back, it's, right? it's half price, but it's you got to walk past the <laughs> breakfast cereal. Exactly. To get to it. And so um, it's it's those kinds of uh, behaviors that we see from businesses everywhere that is going to make this a hard problem. But I think the more that we see the utility and the more opportunities there are for people to be like, this is life changing. Right. You're you're starting to take all of those little stresses and worries. Uh, another example I like to use, just because it's a controversial statement, is uh, imagine never having to pay your bills again. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, your bills get paid. Yeah, that's but, that's kind of where I am. So I'm, my bank pays my bills yeah. uh, monthly. But there's there are ways to do this in the future, where it's not just paying your bills, but it's also managing your finances. Mm -hmm. It's making sure that you're putting stuff in savings and in your 401k and in IRAs or whatever else. It's doing all of that stuff for you because it's so easy as an individual or as a family to be like, oh, we're out of money every month. Yeah. Well, yeah, but you went to four movies and you, you, you bought some other toys and whatever. And like, if you had saved that stuff first, if it had just pulled it away, mm. you wouldn't have had the opportunity to spend that. Or what about the situations where you have more bills than you have money? Right? That happens sometimes. People sure, it used to happen to me a lot. Right, and so in, in those kinds of scenarios, 
it can be smart enough to say, well, I know this bill is okay to miss this month or to push it off for a little while. Mm -hmm. So we're going to wait for the next paycheck to pay that one. And we're just instead, like the same decision you probably would make as a human. Yeah, it's a complex but it, decision. But right it's there. managing it all for you instead. And the argument to be made is who's better at making that decision? You, the individual? making a subjective choice about your individual life right. or artificial intelligence that can use machine learning and the learnings from thousands of other people to make the best decision for you. Uh, and I don't know there's a right answer to that, but it's an interesting question. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing a lot of what you're talking about here. I, for example, I have uh, every month I have money that goes into my 401k, I have money that goes into another account. I have all, almost all my bills get paid automatically. Um, I haven't written a check in probably five years. Right. Uh, uh, but those are decisions I set up in advance, right. and my circumstances might change. Right. You know, maybe I'll maybe my salary will change, for example. Or sure. Maybe I'll get a you know maybe I'll get a bonus, and I want to think about that now. Now I have an action item. Yeah. I'm letting the uh, I'm not letting the computer make that decision for uh, me. An another good example. Do you own a house, I apartment, do. or anything? Um, so a if condo. Oh, you own a condo. Right? You're in Chicago, correct? Yes. Yeah. So um, with something like that, where you have a mortgage. The time that you look at interest rates for mortgages is at the time that you need a mortgage. Right. Or if the, if the rates have dropped so dramatically that the interest rates are low enough to be newsworthy. You might want to refinance. Right. Hey, you, your interest rate is so low you should refinance. Well, you still have to be paying attention. Yep. Nobody's monitoring interest rates on a regular basis unless they're low on money or the interest rates are newsworthy and it's like, right. oh my gosh, this is legendary lows. You should absolutely refinance. But what if instead you got, again, just a simple notification that's like, hey, I just refinanced your house. You saved $80 a month. <laughs> or at least a confirmation maybe right. in that case. Right. But like <laughs> that kind of stuff would be amazing because now, you, oh, my gosh, you just saved me $80 a month on my mortgage without any additional costs. Yeah. Yeah, of course I want to do that. But I wasn't paying attention, but it can pay attention for me. Yeah. I, so you, you mentioned that the people that own the data are hoarding the data. But there's another issue in that the people, individuals, Protect, are protective of their own data. As it's a privacy be. issue. Yeah. And so if I'm going to give a, an AI access to my bank account, you know, uh, imagine uh, I, I tell Alexa about my bank account, and I'm giving it to Amazon, potentially. Right. And Amazon potentially could give it to someone else. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm sure they're, they're fine people at Amazon. Sure, sure, sure. But I don't know that. I, of I have course. To, I have, it's a lot of trust. It is. How and do we get uh, over those and that is foundational, literally foundational to everything that I'm talking about. Right. Like, without trust, none of the rest of this works because right. I don't necessarily want to give you all that context. And yeah. so one of the other things, this is a learning that I had uh, before I joined Amazon. I went to a startup uh, where we were focused on healthcare data. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, I was working for, I was building a new modern electronic medical record system. And the, the, the fundamental idea behind the entire piece of software is that there is only ever one patient record. Um, if you think about how software works today in most healthcare facilities, that your hospital has a record of you, your urgent care has a record of you, your main doctor has a record of you. If you went to a specialist, they have their own record of you. Right. And none of them match. Right. Um, and there have been, you know, there's been legislation to try to help try to synchronize some of those things. But even you'll find that um, they're synchronizing things like address and phone number and social and like core fundamental data. But okay. um, a, a great example is if you, um, if you go to the urgent care this morning uh, to get some new prescriptions or maybe to treat something, and you walk out of the urgent care and you get hit by a bus and they take you to the hospital. Mm -hmm. The hospital has zero chance of knowing anything about the medications you just took that morning that were just prescribed to you. Like none of that information will be mm -hmm. shared, especially if they're not in the same hospital system, right. which is common. Right. So they, that fundamental problem, the, the thing we were trying to solve is there's one patient record and the patient themselves owns it. Right. So in their app, they have access to all of their data. They can choose who has access to what and when. So as they go to, let's say they decide to start visiting a psychologist, the psychologist doesn't need to know anything about their irritable bowel syndrome or any of that other stuff, right? Yeah. So when they choose to share their patient record with that doctor, they're only sharing the stuff that's relevant. Makes Here's sense. the prescriptions I'm on because it might conflict with something you prescribed for me or whatever, but I'm not sharing all these other things because it's not necessary, it's not needed. Absolutely. And the doctor can always request, right? Hey, I really would like to be able to see this stuff. It's, it's relevant to what I'm trying to do, right. whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and then you can approve or deny those things. So imagine taking that model beyond healthcare to just all of your data. Absolutely. And so you own the context for all the things um, whether that's your shopping history on Amazon, whatever, right? It starts to become this object that you personally own, 
and you can decide who and what gets access yeah. to those things. Where today, those individual companies are deciding that for you. And so there's many times where if you look at ad services or anything else, they're, they're selling, it might just be metadata, it might be generic, but they're still selling the opportunity for people to anonymously know that you're an outdoor hunter. So we're, we're gonna target you with ads now that right. are specific to these kinds of things. And they can build a pretty good profile around you without actually knowing yeah. the specifics. And as I said, that's, that's sometimes not useful, sometimes annoying, but it's something that could be malicious. I mean, like yeah. if a potential employer got access to my medical records, there might be something in there that would defer them, you know, the, the deter them from, Completely. I, and from just, hiring me. Just simple things like, like IBS or- yeah. uh, This guy gets sick a lot. You've I had don't a, want to hire a guy that's sick a right, lot. Right, you've had a past cancer diagnosis. Yeah. You're in the clear now, but if I have to pick between two candidates, I'm gonna pick the guy that hasn't had cancer. That seems like something that would be natural for someone to have. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a big blocker, I think. Yeah. Uh, but we're moving there. I think part of the reason we're moving there is because of things like Alexa, because we are surrendering some privacy in mm -hmm. uh, to get some convenience. Yeah. Um, so the, as a society, we're, we're starting to get used to this idea that the world around us is not gonna collapse just because other people see our calendar. Just Agreed. because they see some information, or, or just because our, our bill payers see our bank number. Agreed, and I think that the, the natural thing that comes out of that, if you look at how cell phone adoption went, there, there was a time where if you told people, hey, by the way, you're gonna, you're gonna always carry around a microphone and a camera in your pocket. Right. People would've been like, and it'll oh, have GPS no. That, right, we'll be able to track you, you exactly. your location at any moment. People had said, no way, but when I said, well, but that same device will also be able to get you directions to anywhere on earth, anytime mm -hmm. you need it. Uh, you'll be able to communicate with your family and friends in multiple different ways, however you feel comfortable. Once the utility outweighs the security concern, uh -huh. instantly it's like, yeah, I'll totally do that. It's not instant though. I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a little bit at a time. It, like it we is. have everything described, that technology exists today, but yeah. it's not happening tomorrow. No, 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 you're right. You're, so instant is probably the wrong word to use. But the idea that if we can grow into that utility, right. where it's like, like, I mean, could you imagine now telling people uh, or people even saying like, I'm not carrying a cell phone. Like right. that's, that's a necessity for society today. It is now, I've been without my cell phone in a strange city, I can't, I, I can't use my GPS, I can't call to find it. Right. You know, where's my hotel? Right. Where's my reservation? Yeah, and what are you doing? I gotta, go, printing, I gotta go in the trunk, get the cables out and charge yeah. it somehow. And uh, you end up in this weird situation, I, like uh, not to pick on her, but my mother-in-law, I don't know why she still used MapQuest. I don't know why MapQuest still exists, but I she, didn't know that it is. It does, <laughs> and she she every time they go on a trip, she prints it. She out. prints all of it out on MapQuest, all the individual directions, you know, with screenshots of the roads and uh -huh. whatever. I love her for it. I think it's uh, it's adorable, but at the same token, it's like, but you have it all on your phone. Like it'll alert you when you're about to miss a turn. Yeah. Paper doesn't do that. All right. All right. It's that it's that utility I think that unlocks tell a lot you where of the, the where the uh, red light cameras are, the speed traps are. <laughs> they do that, and it's <laughs> I'm so thankful for that. I can't imagine. Like, it feels like there should be legislation that doesn't allow that. Like, the whole point of a red light camera is to stop people from running red lights, uh, not to just run the red lights that there aren't cameras at, you know? I didn't do that. No, no, never, never, never. Uh, yeah, so I, I think as, as, as we grow into this and as we continue to think about providing valuable utility to customers, which is a, the, the thing that Amazon has found all of its success on, it's how do I make my customers raving fans of my services and products? And right. I mean, you, you look at all the memes that go around during this pandemic, it's like, I don't know how I would have gotten by without Amazon, right? Like people were getting deliveries instead of going to stores and they were getting the, the yeah. products and the services that they needed without having to leave the house. And it wasn't just Amazon, obviously. There's tons and tons of companies that made that possible. But right. um, that's, a, that's a key laser focus for Amazon is how do we make our customers happier than anyone else? Mm -hmm. And that's where all of their successes come from. How do we, how do we like, um, Jeff Bezos for a long time had a, had a set of um, absolute truths. There's never a time a customer will ask for slower delivery. Like <laughs> They never will. So why should we should optimize around making delivery as fast as possible. And that's mm -hmm. why you see things like two day, one day, right. two hour delivery. Um, people don't want to spend a lot of time in checkout. No one will ask for checkout to take longer. So they started thinking about things like Amazon Go and how do we let mm -hmm. people just walk into a store and walk out with products and they never talk to or interact with another person ever. Mm. And it works amazing. It, it's, yeah. it's, have you had a chance to be in a ghost store? I've been in the stores, but I've never actually used that process. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, w uh, there's one right in the building where, where my team works in Seattle, mm. and uh, we used to have races. The, the idea was you had to go in and get an entire meal. This included <laughs> like a sandwich, a snack, and a drink. And it tells you how long you were in the store. Uh, and so the goal was to try to do that in under 10 seconds. <laughs> like, <laughs> go into the store, get the three. Maybe I'll try. There are a few of them in Chicago. Yeah, it's, um, it feels like stealing. 
It really, <laughs> it, it does feel like it, you feel like you're doing something wrong, but it's amazing as you're walking down the sidewalk back to your, your apartment or whatever. Looking over your shoulder you get the, to see you if get, No, you get the notification <laughs> and it's like, oh, you were in the store for three minutes and 42 seconds. Here's the three pr- products you bought. And you're like, how could it know that? And because, that because of that, we do all sorts of crazy things to try to beat the system. Uh, like I'll walk up to a shelf and I will hold my coat open. Uh-huh. And I will take a product with my other hand, and I will just shove it into my coat. There's no way a camera or any other, because there are lots of sensors on the ceiling. Right. There's no way anything could have seen what I did. It's there's still, some it's, sort of near field something, it, something. It's still new. Well, there's, there's sensors in the shelves. There's all sorts of stuff. <laughs> but I've, I've even messed it where I'll take a product off of the designated location that it goes, and I'll move it to an entire other place in the store, and I'll, like, shove it back in a corner. <laughs> and then a troublemaker. the next day, I will go take that thing out of that place and put it in my coat secretly. And walk out of store. It still works. It still got it. Oh yeah. <laughs> I have not I, been able I, I to drove on the tollway to get here, and it took four days for that toll to uh, for them to charge me for the toll. Right. And meanwhile, <laughs> uh, real physical goods and services they can they can get you in minutes. It's uh, it's it's cool. And I I I've heard rumors, I, not internally, but I've heard stories that like they're starting to introduce that technology into full grocery stores. Hmm. So uh, imagine just walking through a grocery store, filling up your cart, walking out to your car. Nice. You don't have to stop and check out. Uh-huh. Uh, that sounds awesome. All the future. I love it. I'm looking forward to the future. Jeff, thanks so much. Really interesting stuff. This was great, man. Thank you. It's always good to talk with you. Definitely. I am here at the CodeMash conference. We're here talking about software and technology, and my favorite part is spending time with so many friends I've made from this industry. It's an awesome time.